Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Whale Nerds Podcast. This is episode number 78. My name is Slater, and I'm here with Adam and Caitlin. What's up? Hello. We also have a special guest this week. We're here with Ted Cheeseman. Uh, Ted is a California native who's worked for decades with wildlife, and he's been an expedition guide for Cheeseman's uh, ecology safaris in addition to organizing and leading expeditions all over the world. And he's also a co-founder of Happy Whale, which is a community science-based photo ID project, and it's a database and matching system, which we talk about a lot on the podcast because we're huge fans of Happy Whale, and we're so excited to get to talk to you, Ted. Hey, yeah, awesome. Thanks. Um, That's super fun. Um, Knowing you guys from sort of whale community for a long time. Um, I love, I I just get such a kick when I listen to one of your podcasts, like the the happy whale news. I'm like, oh, that's so (laughs) cool. I love that people, you know, it's like adding value. So yeah. And then the only thing I'd want to add is that I'm too, so I'm doing a PhD. I'm in the middle of a PhD, which is based off of the data, some a relatively small part of the data that's coming out of Happy Whale and, and just having a lot of fun with it. So super fun to chat with you all. Yeah, we're so yes, excited. Sir. Yeah. I think one of the questions that we always ask guests, and it's a question that we get asked a lot um, from new followers to the podcast is how did you first become involved in the marine field, so to speak? I mean, everybody has such a unique story about how they got into whales or whatever they do with the ocean so I guess that'd be that'd be how I'd want to start off with you is how did you get involved in the marine side of things sure um so my father was a zoology professor and my mother was like super avid bird watcher nature people they my mom's story is like oh yeah he was the first guy I ever met who owned a bird book like that's why she found so total total nerd (laughs) yeah nerd credentials from before birth I love it um but, um, but yeah, so my, and my father studied, I think uh, marine, you know, marine mammals were, was his true love, but he taught ecology, field biology. And so, and then I grew up with them leading safaris. So as a kid, it was like summertime going off to, you know, Africa and whatever. And, and, and um, it was kind of pretty unusual childhood. But in 1994, I got to lead an expedition to Antarctica with them as I was, my, my parents were the expedition leaders. I was a Zodiac driver and stuff. And, and other than being just brutally seasick for a lot of the <laughs> trip, um, I, I gradually um, over, well, and that was something that we did almost every year from then actually, and still now COVID notwithstanding, I go south just about every year. And, over that time from 1994 to 2010, I did not see a single whale around the island of South Georgia. And which was just like such a crazy thing to not see because on the island of South Georgia are the remains of the world's largest whaling stations, like one after another, like three of the largest whaling stations ever built were are literally in one bay to the next like just like a couple miles apart right so it's just like this is where the whales were and where are they now so that was just this kind of like this history i'm like well what's up you know and i've always had this huge love of like intact ecosystems and of course you go to a place like antarctic and you assume it's that because you don't see human impact but then you think about like well but the whales aren't here like talk about the biggest you know things in the ecosystem and so honestly it wasn't so much that but it was the gradual seeing a recovery so in 2011 we first started seeing whales around south georgia the antarctic peninsula we were always seeing some whales but it was just gradually more and more and more and to me as an expedition guide it was like okay well here's this thing I'm seeing, but I don't really feel like I have access to the science around it. And yet at the same time here, we're taking all these pictures like, oh, you know, we're re- recording whatever whales we saw and like, that's gotta have some scientific value. So I think I, I, I went back to guiding after my master's degree because it was a job. I had a young family. It was an awesome job as compared to say like working in conservation science and Washington DC or something like that that sounded yeah. sort of like yeah. soul crushing um, absolutely absolutely <laughs> thing that had to do with whales <laughs> right so it was like oh I can go to Antarctica and all this and and but I always had this like I want to get back into science and so this 
this idea, honestly, it wasn't like, ooh, I'm going to get into science. It was like, I just want to do this thing. I want to try this. You know, can I make a bridge between us, the public, citizen scientists, to, you know, data for the sciences and get from the science something valuable for us? And I came at it from a, I'm a citizen science point of view. And, you know, a couple of years down the road, Happy Well started working and suddenly it was like, oh, here's all this data. We need to, you know, and some folks were using it, Cascadia, um, John Kalmokidis in particular was quite receptive to this kind of new source of data coming out of the um, tour operators, whale watch operations that they weren't getting data from and such. But, um, but it was just like, whoa, you know, here's a lot more that's accumulating. And um, Phil Clapham, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but mm -hmm. just super, yeah, I mean, awesome scientist for, for many years. And we, um, our data manager gave him at the time gave him a demo of our of the the matching tool we had which was far less accurate than what we have now and he sort of got in touch with me and like gave me this big verbal smack that was like <laughs> okay citizen science is cute but this is a research tool could you mm -hmm. please use this for research and get researchers to collaborate with this and yeah. that was, and, and it was kind of through that, it was like this conversation. And then like, that was like on a Thursday and by Monday I was enrolled in a PhD program and I was kind of on Tuesday going, what, what did I just commit to? Like, yeah, where'd you sign up? Where'd I come from? Yeah, <laughs> totally. So, but it, yeah, yeah, so it was kind of a accidental, um, but it's been so inspiring and in, ever since, yeah. Cool, so it kind of all like came together, the Marine, reignited passion for you happy whale all of it kind of molded together after seeing all this progress in antarctica with whales so yeah that and getting over seasickness that was huge <laughs> totally like hey that's a lucky thing right, right. well I mean, yeah i know it's pretty intense yeah i hear it's pretty bad getting down there you know I think the worst in the world is trying to get out to the Farallons personally. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, true. I oh, mean, man. or, you know, it's just like Monterey on a, on a, on a bad day versus yeah. like oh, all week. <laughs> yeah. I know you guys who do those afternoon trips, man. I'm like morning. Oh, I mean, awesome morning. <laughs> yeah. Morning. Yeah. Trips I'm, like a, I'm like a 8 a.m. to uh, 11 now. <laughs> I wish people would have believed me all those years that I answered the phone there and was like, please go in the morning. Cause I feel like we just torture them every afternoon. Well, and the best part, it seems like it's like the people that don't want to go in the morning want to go in the afternoon. Cause they're up drinking the night before. Yeah. And that yeah. just makes like, it way worse. That's going to work out real good for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's whale watching. I know. Right? Yeah. They're yeah. like, well, we don't want to get up that early. I'm like, you really do. Okay. Yes, you do. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, but totally the success of the one kind of just, it's just been, I mean, now it's kind of like, I've got this monster that I got to keep feeding, which is that happy mm -hmm. world. It's like, Oh, I actually had no, you know, I kind of envisioned it as a year, maybe a two year project. And here it is, you know, six years since we started the website and, and certainly another year before that of kind of like putting the pieces together and, I mean, it's, it's become kind of a backbone of certain, like in the North Pacific, you know, we now know probably at very minimum 60% of living individual humpbacks that are like wow. that's the entire ocean, you know? Yeah. And I estimate that from like pieces of, okay, so we'll get, we, I got a set of images from um, University of Alaska Southeast of some 2010 work off the, out in the Aleutians, right? So just like, super random middle of nowhere ocean right more or less and um where there's not a lot of local effort and we're matched a lot of those whales to hawaii a lot of those and over it was like 65 percent of the whales were known oh, right wow. and the other but whereas here in monterey I, like if i get a good photo i'm like wait there's no match what is is there yeah. something wrong like of <laughs> yeah. course we know this whale you know it's still probably 20 percent of the whales here we don't know but yeah that's mm -hmm. So it's just become this super awesome resource. And I'm and so a lot of my thinking is like, okay, how, how does it, one, how do I get my dang PhD done? But two, how, how do we keep this thing moving rather than it just being, well, it's not all on me. Thank goodness. I have a couple of really cool data managers, Marilia and Haley and, yeah. and then Ken, my partner in programming it all and, and stuff. Yeah, it's good. It's a good team.
Uh, Mar- Marilia actually sent me a message the other day and she screen grabbed one of my videos and she was like, I know that whale. And she sent me all the facts <laughs> about him. I think it's so cool when they do that. And, and it's nice when they do it too, because then you get a bunch of information about the whale, you know, without having to, you know, go and dive through it. So yeah, pretty cool. love that. I know it's totally, it's like, I kind of am of two minds. Like when people post stuff on Facebook, I'm like, hey, if I just start like telling you where the whale is, then, you know, <laughs> then people expect us to come to them but like yeah you know, facebook don't do much for you know they just sort of yeah. die there whereas in happy world it's sort of part of this living data set but mm-hmm. yeah but it's so fun to be like hey really yeah so that um what was it on um the secrets of whales that oh yeah yeah she was like oh i i managed to, i did screen grabs of i can't remember then it was like of eight whales and we matched five of them like Two dogs, wow. one to Tonga and a couple to Alaska or something. They just like, did wow, she send that awesome. to Brian Scary? I think he'd get a kick out of that. That's uh, funny. I, you know what? No, no. You know what's funny is imagine you like fact check these documentaries and you're like, yeah, you totally they're like, you're like, they're like oh whale. yeah, we were filming in Tonga and you look and it's like this whale's off of Australia or something like that. You know what I mean? It's just <laughs> totally. it's a Hawaiian whale, yeah. Yeah, or yeah, exactly, a Hawaiian whale. That'd be that'd be pretty. Like fun. you cheated, you filmed in too many places. <laughs> yeah, totally happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the series of events. You're like, wait, that's not. Nope, no, not, not the same right. whale. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> so I kind of I don't know. I envision like how I would tell people in one sentence: Happy Whales like a platform for whales to tell their own story, um, because it has like you know it tracks the whale over time, and people can follow the whale. It's like social media for whales, kind of. Um, But I guess what would be, like, what are some of, like, your favorite things that have come out of Happy Whale as far as, like, people making connections or uh, researchers getting, you know, better resolution on data sets or things like that? I love that. Honestly, Happy Whale, the whales tell their own story. Like, you know, one could flatter oneself and and, and imagine them caring, you know, what. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. But no, but that's so cool. And it's, it is, you know, so, so there's some are the two places that we know in most detail are coastal California and then Southeast Alaska, the inside passages, right? And especially the further you get kind of into the inside passages like Juno, you don't have a huge number of whales and there's a lot of site fidelity. And that's one that there's a whale named Flame who showed up with her third calf in three years. Wow. I heard about that. I heard about that. Yeah. That's crazy. Right? Wait, she she showed up with the same calf for three years. No, no, no. no, no. no. Three different. Oh, three different. Okay, wow. Yeah. And we thought it would be like every other year, right, for humpbacks. Exactly. But three in three years is pretty incredible. Yeah. So, I mean, first, there's, there's this, there is the, you know, just being able to track that. And of course, people do quite a bit right but then to be able to like so I go in and there's you know 100 and well there's there's a there's data and happy was a bit complex and there's some research data that's not totally visible but I see you know and I think so I think publicly visible there's like 170 encounters or something of flame and almost all of them are right in Juneau one is way south and up in British Columbia relative to wherever she else is otherwise and then fiverr in hawaii and that's super cool because up until recently it was like oh flame disappears where does she go somewhere you know it's from southeast alaska you assume hawaii but it's not guaranteed um but that one i guess kind of the little bonus of it is like i was just looking and there's a there's there's a handful of researchers who you know they can ask me like, hey, what's this detail? But there's also like the comment field on encounters. And then they, you know, and the more engaged users, someone makes a comment, they get a notification, hey, there's a comment. And and so you get this like, it's a way for the researchers to reach out and one, get data about things that they care about. Mm-hmm. Um, and then two, to be able to, you know, conveniently interact with folks without, just the like email crush of you know trying to reach all these different folks or whatever i mean i like that standardization but yeah um but 
yeah okay so what's my favorite thing my single favorite project that's going on right now there's a lot of things that have been talked about and we'll see what happens but there is this project going on right now um it's university of hawaii hawaii manoa um lars Bider and martin um, van Eswegen, um pacific whale foundation alaska whale foundation so a whole bunch of people involved but what they're doing, Martin is doing his PhD, taking, um, taking, using drones to go and take body condition assessments of the whales. And then they're taking photos of the whales at the same time. They're also doing some biopsy sampling, but it's a lot easier to get, um, get a photo ID than to get the biopsy. So then we take that photo ID and match it to wherever else we've seen the whale and they're getting samples body condition samples of the same whales on the breeding grounds and the feeding grounds and, the and then progressively grounds. through the seasons so it's literally and especially for the mothers and calves watching mom grow on the feeding grounds and then shrink on the breeding grounds, breeding grounds. Wow. and then babies growing and so like he, he when we talked towards the end of his hawaii season when he was looking at stuff and just like the numbers and the numbers of whales we're able to match, instead of it being like, ooh, I hope we can find one or two, it's like hundreds of whales. And with that, you know, and then he's telling me sort of some of these stats of how much the whales are growing and how much mom is shrinking with, you know, converting that, converting mom's biomass, right? Because they're capital breeders, right? They feed, 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 take all that energy down to the breeding grounds, you know, Have a turn baby. it into milk, turn it into yeah. baby, right? And then, and then, and so mom's shrinking, baby's growing. And then for mom to go back, to, I mean, this with flame, for her to be able to, you know, conceive, bring to term, and, and, and then deliver the on, an, on an already Three. like used up budget. <laughs> totally. And that's what Martin was saying. And I, I mean, I, you know, I don't know the details of his, his, his findings so far, because obviously it's unpublished yet, but it's just this like the mom's body after a year of feeding baby. I mean, it, yeah, it's a level of demands. It just boggles my mind. It's incredible. So, yeah. You know, I totally, have- I totally, I I can't wait to see those papers and actually have those numbers. Yeah, that's going to be awesome. 100 pounds of mom makes how many pounds of baby or what? Yeah, exactly. We got a little like teaser from Pack Whales Research Department where it's suggesting like that third of the body weight number is actually an underestimate for a lactating female. Yeah. Yeah, So she may lose more than a third of her body mass like throughout that whole process is what some of the data is leaning towards now. That's which is so crazy to me like that's <laughs> nuts how crazy would it be to have like a, a basically a video sequence of all those photos right taken over time and they're all dated and it's like did, did you see the body going like that then it gives birth there's a calf next to it you know what i mean I love that it. would be cool. that would be really cool i think that well, would be a good way to get the point across yeah that's a great you know from you right who's like the visual aspect of it see this is this is where honestly to me this is like the community aspect of it is like martin's there doing the work you know we're here doing the matching but i don't think in terms of the visual communication that's yeah. an awesome idea i would love that i mean time lapse of mom's yeah. body well yeah. and they would That'd all be, be like very line up proportionally for shots already right because you have to get them close anyway to do yeah. analysis From the you have the telemetry meter on it right yeah yep. yeah yeah so they do it. definitely yeah it's a little al- laser altimeter mm-hmm. i, I yeah. can't remember exactly the specifics but yeah essentially so that they get you know it's, it's just geometry right and then they're using a bit of trig to turn that into volume of the whale because mm-hmm. she's not a mm-hmm. perfect sphere but you know whatever roughly um, they have magic numbers <laughs> magic numbers <laughs> yeah. yes yeah it's cool but that's 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 one of my favorite projects that's in the works there's there's a lot of other stuff where, and that's what's exciting to me. It's like, okay, cool. I'm doing this PhD. I'm like, oh, population assessment and, you know, distribution of migratory patterns and stuff. But that's just kind of this like little tip of the iceberg that once you get all these whale, this whale data together, it's like, who knows what can, you know, what can come out of it. So, yeah. What is your current PhD focused on with Happy Whale? getting it done (laughs) good answer Uh, yeah no so um chapter 
well, in terms of data chapters, there's like a paper about the algorithm, right? Which is like, okay, here's how we match a gazillion whales, right? Um, then a paper about literally about the data set, right? Because that in and of itself is, I mean, this is the biggest, in terms of individual identification, there's never been a data set like this for any marine mammal, um, especially not across a whole ocean basin. Um, and then, um, and then a about migratory patterns for North and South Pacific humpback whales is probably like two chapters. So in particular, North Pacific. So there's this classic splash study and splash was, yeah. was you, you just totally nailed it. Like, it's so cool to build off of that history, which is the study 2004, 2006, 8,000 different whales photo ID'd and a lot of them biopsied, I think like 3,000 of them biopsied. Um, and so a lot of genetics too, um, but I'm not touching the genetic parts here um, in 18,000 encounters. And you just imagine the human hours matching all these photos. But so we've kind of built from there and Splash was a little bit short in some areas like Russia and such. But it also was just these few years and there's some of these patterns like we're seeing that a lot of whales, you know, they meander more over the course of a lifetime. So does that mm -hmm. matter? Is it just like, oh, there's an exception or is that like, you know, significant to, you know, epidemiology, some kind of disease transfer? Is it sig significant to cultural transmission like song or actually genetics and such? You know, what, what, what does this all mean? I'm not so much going into the what, but the, you know, how, what is the population status? So I've been working a bunch with uh, Phil Clapham and his, and his partner, Yulia, who, um, Yulia is just is this amazing work. Incredible person. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, totally. It's, yeah, such an awesome person, right? And did you, you did an interview with her? No, um, no I've met, okay. I've briefly uh, met her at conferences and Phil yeah. too, but we didn't do yeah. an interview with her. So her PhD was <clears throat> digging out all these, and I love it. There's all these great stories, like records of illegal whaling that were hidden in a potato shed, you know, during wow. the, the the you know the Cold War war era. But literally translating all these Russian documents and showing us, gee, why is it that these population models aren't matching what we what we're seeing? Well, because the population models are based on this many whales killed, but actually there was you know, an extra however many tens of thousands killed by the legal Russian whaling campaign and bummer mm -hmm. that. I mean, I don't want to point fingers at Russia's because we, we had our own whaling history and it was absolutely know, huge impact. But, um, but um, so like what migratory patterns do we see in the North Pacific? What migratory patterns do we see in the South Pacific? Um, and, and, then, and then what's the status of populations? Um, so it gets a bit dry, but at the end of the day, it's kind of remarkable to me that like, you know, just a couple of years ago, we were saying like, oh yeah, there's about 2000 whales in, you know, coastal California. Now we're like, actually there's maybe almost double of that, or at least 3000 is kind of these rough numbers. Um, that's based on a technical memo from Calum Bukitis and Jay Barlow and such. But um, so, yeah, it's been, it's been so cool working with you know this whole range of researchers but it's sometimes it's a little hard to separate what is my actual work compared to these just like all these giants i'm kind of like oh yeah i'm not worthy you know <laughs> oh, you are yeah right you're crushing it <laughs> yeah you're crushing it well it's it's cool when you have like these one-off whales like um i remember recently that whale top gun showed up yeah. in california right and that's like a russian a russian whale and, you know, we always talk about how, oh, you know, our whales here in California traverse from, you know, Santa Barbara, uh, California, and Monterey, California, down to Cabo or down to Costa Rica. But then you have a whale that shows up from Russia. And it's just yeah. like, what? Like, that's, that's crazy to me. So random. And uh, what is that? I mean, especially, so that whale. Yeah. I mean, I totally, I remember it quite clearly, one, because it was so heavily killer whale scarred. It was so beat up, yeah. Brutalized, and the Russian image of it, um, you know, it looks like it must have been a juvenile. So it was like, mm -hmm. well, was this whale just so traumatized? But he just left. Like, I'm not something. going back there. I'm out of here, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. A little, little to know. Yeah, we unfortunately killer whales here too for them. But, but you know, but I mean, so and it's so funny, right? So Cabo, it's like LAX for whales, right? They're just going yeah. everywhere. But very clearly, if you're a whale from Central America, you might go through north, northern. If you're a humpback whale, from might go through northern Mexico. You, you, you're likely to go by Cabo but you're almost certainly only gonna go to California, maybe Oregon, right? And especially more Southern California, it seems, right? Whereas another whale passing through Cabo, there's a lot of whales that go from there to Russia, which is something that Splash didn't much pick up. And it's really, it's just like, why would a whale from Russia it's come all crazy. the way? Yeah, right? Gray whales do it too. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. That's just a lot of ocean to cover when like you would think like, you know, Monterey is right there. There's a ton of food for you right there. Like why would you have to make that huge crossing? But you know, that data is just so interesting well, to me. Why didn't you stop in Hawaii? Like yeah, for breeding. Exactly. For breeding, oh. yeah. yeah. Oh. Halfway. You could stop. That's probably less. <laughs> well, that's that's another thing that is I love about Happy Whales, the stats, the stats page. The stats and yeah, so you click individuals awesome. and, and not only can you see how many people are helping you and like the top contributors, but then the individuals of the whales, like the, the top one, the furthest traveled, the one that's uh, between Russia, Mexico, and what is it? Um, Freaking Marianas Islands. Yeah. Yeah. Mar <laughs> yeah. That's, <crazy>. that's ridiculous. <laughs> what? Yeah. What, why didn't it just go like, what? <laughs> why do you do what you do? <laughs> totally. So are you working on anything um, in particular with like California coastline stuff with humpback whales with for your PhD or is that just like a, another interest through happy whale? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so there's the places that are super well documented that give us the chance to, to, to do a few things. One is like, if we have this so well documented here, you know, there's like this concept of, oh, what is oversampling? Like, it, mm -hmm. is there a point at which it's just like, who cares about the next data point? Like, is that just too much data or not? Um, and this was kind of a surprise. It's like when I started just digging through all the data, like taking every photo that I could get from, um, from Monterey Bay, you'd expect that after however many hundreds of whales that it'd be like, okay, you're only going to be seeing the same whale. And we kept seeing more and more and more whales. Mm -hmm. And that was, that, was, that was kind of a surprise, a bit of a shocker um, in that, you know, you have like with, they have a lot of site fidelity, right? If you're back in Moss Landing or you're back in kind of these, especially it seems like more complex geography feeding areas, you get more of the same whales, but then, but then there's these cycles of whales coming through. And I think especially mm -hmm. like these whales that feed more on the, um, the continental shelf or feed more out the Farallons or more kind of open ocean conditions. And then a wind event comes and then a whole bunch of them come into Monterey and you just see different whales all the way through. But my real interest here is a couple things. One is like, if we can document these whales really well, and then we could like take this data set and tear it apart, tear it down and say, okay, well, okay. So based on seeing this many whales, we know in fine detail with strong confidence that this is the size of the population and so on and so forth. Then you go over to say, I don't know, um, you know, outer coast, um, oh, say, say like Northern, Northern British Columbia, for example, is an area where there's kind of a gap that there's not a ton of data, right? There's some, there's some, or like Western Alaska where there's some big gaps, there are Aleutians, huge gaps. Um, and, and so if you say like, okay, here, we've got this incredible data here. If we break it down to just those little, you know, much smaller data sets, at what point does the resolution fall apart? So it allows mm -hmm. us to say, okay, well, you know, here's the whole of the ocean. Can we kind of like model around so that we can understand year by year, um, what's happening with the population? So for me, the really interesting st stuff starts to be like, okay, you know, we are urbanizing our oceans with ever more, you know, marine traffic, with fishing gear, with, I just I saw that there's a, you know, proposal for wind farms on the California coast, so on and so forth. These things that, you know, 
for good or bad, they are happening, right? So at what point do they genuinely change the habitat for these whales? And then obviously climate change, the blob, well, we, we now are starting to, you know, it took a few years, but it's pretty clear that that basically drove the anchovy cycle that caused the whales to come in further, that caused, um, you know, more entanglements, right? And it caused mm -hmm. this, just this total breeding failure up in, feeding and breeding failures in, uh, in, in, in uh, Southeast Alaska and Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So I really want to see this all applied to that. Um, mm -hmm. And especially, you know, so California has a mix of the Central American population and this, these, these population designations, well, they're, they're, they're problematic, but in concept, there's the Central American whales, which are deemed endangered. And then there's the Mexican whales that are deemed threatened. And mm -hmm. we have a mix of them in California. It seems like maybe 25% of our whales would be considered at least Southern Mexico or Central American. Well, those whales are living in some of the most urbanized and heavily pot fished waters anyway, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it's like, are they not recovering in Central America because of ship strikes or entanglements or something hmm. happening down in Central America? Like, yeah. is the that's water- It's an interesting thing to, to talk yeah. about or just look at, you know, like that's, that's the, the whole point of happy whale, I mean, it seems like just to find those those hidden gems that like, you know, bring up those questions. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's yeah. pretty and it's, awesome. And it's, we know for sure that it's a separate population or is it just the population is trickled further down over time? I feel like it's a very gray area. <laughs> that's such yeah. a good question. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's, it. it's, it's kind of this like, and it's a funny one too, because then it gets political because, yeah. because because it's an endangered species listing, like one whale from Central America showing up in an area, suddenly it's like, whoa, that's an endangered humpback whale. But another whale, especially like if it's a whale from Hawaii, oh, that's a fully recovered whale, no problem. So that totally changes, especially in the federal context, right? If it's mm -hmm. a federal rule, something like a, you know, an interstate or dredging project or something that requires federal permitting, totally different context if it's a fully recovered well but yeah so i'm not i mean some of this stuff it's like i have some ideas about and but there's a lot of other uh researchers i'm working with and it's kind of like their project so but mm -hmm, i'm yeah. seeing there's something different about the central american whales um that that makes me think that well, first of all, it's not that they've just trickled down and certainly not recently, like historically yeah. they were there, right? And we don't really know how many of the Central American whales were the ones that were hunted because the whaling wasn't there. <laughs> so you have this problem of like, okay, if so many whales were killed, you know, in coastal California, how many were Central American? How many, yeah. is it the same proportions? Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, to me, you know, you're totally right, Adam. There's two parts to this. Um, one is, um, you know, is this, is like, can we, can we get enough data together in good condition that we can start to really have resolution from that? And then the other part to me is just like the accessibility. Can we do it, make it in a way Absolutely. that folks like yourselves are just like, oh, cool. And here it is right at my fingertips so that it's not mm -hmm. like abstract and in some, you know, peer reviewed journal that, yeah, Caitlin, it's awesome that you read them, but the rest of us are just kind of like, uh, and I just read the abstract. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But that's, that's the beauty of happy whale. We, we talk about it every single day on our boat. You know, we're like, we, you know, these whales are beautiful or these tails are beautiful to look at, but they play an important part in research. And like you on the boat, if you get a picture of this whale, Upload it to Happy Whale and, and and see and see what happens from it. You know, it's just it's such a perfect way to communicate science between hey, you know, these images are being used for research in X amount of countries and places and you know around the world, and you can be a part of that. And and that I think is so special because right. you know, like we were saying, you know, whether it's flame or scarlet, you know, you identify that humpback whale and then you can follow it. You can learn about it you can talk to other people that have seen it and you know hear from their encounters of it and it's just we talk about it all the time on the boat and people are always so stoked to hear about it so 
Love I it, think man. the first time I met Katerina Oddly, I was like, hi, we have whales in common. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Nice. Yeah, I did that the other day, actually. Is um, Delaney, you know Delaney, yeah? yeah. She, um, she, yeah. She, um, she sent some images and I, for some reason she, you know, she uploaded them, but she texted me as well. And I, I, think, um, I was looking and I'm like, do, 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 you know, interesting. So I was a mother and calf and I, I need the mom. And um, and then later that day, I'm like, oh, I've seen that whale too, you know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. Got my own notification. I <laughs> love it. And there's something about that that's just so fun to talk about, you know, individuals, and it it yeah. really just changes your whole outlook on the ocean, yeah. right? Like when I see some mm-hmm. of my favorite whales, I'm like, okay, yeah, they're doing good. Like they're eating, you know, they're going down to the to, to Cabo or wherever they're going, and, and and they're coming back, and you know they're staying in Santa Barbara or they're going back to Monterey. I mm-hmm. think it's so interesting. And to go along with that, like one of one of my favorite things about whales is like watching them recover from the whaling era. Yeah. And I think Happy Whale does such a good job at 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 helping us tell that story. You know, in places like Monterey or in places like the San Juan Islands, right? Like yeah. these are whales that have you know some sort of culture has been lost theoretically because of the whaling era right and these whales are just showing up in these new places and they're taking whales and their buddies with them right like like big mama like her whole story yeah and, and i, so I love that story and then like right? I, it's so cool and then i i identified i worked there for a whole summer and i think i only got a couple yes. of humpback of humpback photos but i identified frankenstein who was a you know hawaiian whale that goes to the san juans and i was just like oh that's so cool like i've never been to maui but i have a whale that's been to maui so <laughs> I'm almost there. So I have a question about, you know, like other, so management, right? That's a tricky thing. And is Happy Whale now going to be a tool that researchers use to help, you know, inform the latest stock assessments and, and give that to management to make decisions about, you know, are we, if we have Central American whales in California, how does that affect endangered species considerations, that kind of stuff is, is that a tool that Happy Whale's um, providing to them totally yeah yeah very much so um i mean it's it's sort of early days yet in terms of it getting to that place and part of that is like a sense of legitimacy mm-hmm. um part part of it is having the actual data and then an- another step is like people recognizing that hey this isn't just you know there's this there's this um kind of this uh, context or this assumption that citizen science data is just a mess, right? Or it's just like, oh yeah, that's cute and fun to do, but is it really something? Well, here, actually in the North Pacific, the majority of data in here is is research collaborator derived, um, but it's really, really supported by, you know, it's like if you go from one place to the next, Monterey Bay or coastal California, it's mostly from, you know, contributors such as you know every whale watch Mm -hmm. operator is to me that's just such a phenomenal resource because we're out there day after day it is yeah right and that's you know we don't have the depth of doing a focal follow we're not biopsying the whale we're not putting suction cup tags on the whale but we're photographing the whale every day and so Mm -hmm. you you know and at this point i mean i haven't you know i haven't really gone there to this place of saying okay well, what percentage of the population are we capturing every year or every mm-hmm. season or even within season change over time? But yeah, I'm, I'm super excited for basically building out that one, the sustainability and like two, the accessibility and robustness of all that, which is kind of like this next chapter of my PhD that I'm writing is really about that. Like, what is this data and why is it, mm-hmm. you know, how is it standardized? How is it? Because to me, like citizen science has has kind of like two goals. And one is for the citizen and one is for the science. Like it should be fun Absolutely. and rewarding and interesting, right? Great. Well, to me, the fun and rewarding interesting is so that the person learns something by it, but it's also so that they come back. And it's when mm-hmm. somebody comes back, the one-off photos quite frankly like the 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 contributor who sends us one photo once hey that might be a total gem of a picture but chances yeah. are chances are it's probably not going to be the perfect flute shots chances are it's yeah. probably going to be like the cameras set wrong and all the rest of it mm-hmm. they don't want to know what boat they were on and all these things like it's not like i don't want those one-off pictures but the person that turns around and goes back whale watching another exactly. time 
with their camera set, they know what they're looking for, and they're like, cool, I can do this. It's that second time, or you know, from the naturalist, the hundredth time that that yeah. though that's the high value data, right? So mm-hmm. um and then so for the science, it's like, how do you take the, you know, the messiness of what you might get from the general public and put structure into it? And so that's, you know, and once we put structure in such that somebody from NOAA can look and say, okay, you know, give us the data that you have. I mean, one of the things early on, I'm like giving this data to folks and being like, look, where you see sightings of whales isn't necessarily where whales are. That's where we're looking. So we have mm-hmm. to think about that and yeah. make sure that we you know, account for effort bias because mm-hmm. we have so many whales in Monterey Bay, but there's a ton of whales out in the Farallon Islands and there's just not so many boats there. There's a ton mm-hmm. of whales on the, you know, further up the coast. And there's just not so many boats there yeah. and so on. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, that's, it's, you know, where this all goes, I don't know, because in five years, if it's still me <laughs> sitting here going every week, like, okay, you know, is there anything like super spurious? And it is, yeah, then, you know, that would be a failure to me. It's like, this has got to go towards some kind of like institutional underpinning. I don't know what that looks like, but um, I mean, mostly right now I'm focused on like really making making it you know just incrementally be a better experience and the tools more readily available like kind of like hint of you know foretelling or uh, foreshadowing is like i'm so looking forward to when when you upload the images you'll get a match right away right so it's yeah. just like you get to say yes this is correct no it's not correct or uh, i'm not sure yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and then then you can be. I mean, I'm on. I'm out whale watching, and I photograph a whale, and I yeah. photograph the back of my camera. Yeah, I'm like, I've seen him do it. <laughs> yeah, totally. And I'm just like, hey, folks, yeah, this whale. Well, so when you saw me do that, Slater, since then now, so then it took about about a minute and a half per photo. Yeah. It now takes under a second per photo. What? Like we just we wow. retooled it. So the algorithm is just on it now. Oh, dude, it's so sick. It's so That's funny. Awesome. <laughs> I literally, it will ID <gasps> 700 photos in a minute, right? Wow. wow. It's just like, wait, did that actually work? And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is against 50,000 known whales. So this is this is based on um some some retooling of the algorithm that can um you know. My, my partner the developer ken just finished like a couple weeks ago, a week ago last week something like that no, two weeks ago because it was working when i was last out on the water and it's just silly it's totally silly so <laughs> i gotta, I gotta have you do it on the boat again sometime here oh, short, totally but, well and so yeah so like what i want to do is go from there and like okay so now we've got this working to build it out so that you can be there on the boat and you can send it in and, and so on and so forth is th- that's a goal. It's there's a lot of steps we're actually Ken and I are going to meet tomorrow to plot out what it takes to do that. Um, that's but, so awesome. Yeah. Right. And even if you like, let's say, let's say you do you use your phone. It's, it's like technically the app, right? That you, you take the photo of it and you upload it and it scans it, it tells you who it is. Maybe it doesn't even have to submit it right then to the database and you can still do it at home on the computer you know get all the all the you know coordinates and all that but at least you can be like oh that's fran and you know she was first sighting was 1998 or whatever it was right and then you know you have a lot of info to go off it with as a naturalist too on the boat which would be you know that's totally the goal yeah so what i'm thinking is like okay so the idea is like you know honestly on on one side like if it was like oh just throw your images here and we'll tell you who the match is then it's like okay well then we you know then it's then we don't end up getting the 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 research product right yeah so what i think we'll do is we'll set it up right now we have this concept of the advanced contributor which is like you go in you upload your photos and you like you build out the encounter and in that Mm. process you could do get a match and we'll have this whole kind of like it's like okay cool you know you're doing it right cool we'll give you access to this matching but then also we know if you're out whale watching and you're guiding and you're photographing and you want to be able to just tell people well you do it there and then we'll give you access to that 
with the understanding yeah. that you will go in and do the, yeah. the more full process later. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's kind of part of this balance of getting it right. Oh man, figuring out, figuring out website interface. Maybe, Oof, maybe it's a, uh, it's a, a paid for application for naturalists, one, uh, like a one-time fee or something. I mean, I would, I would, I'd yeah. pay I don't know how much I'd pay for it, whatever it seems. I'd pay, I'd, 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 I'd pay a, I mean, I'd pay 150 bucks for like a year of Happy Whale or, or 15 bucks a month or whatever it is. I think yeah. something like that. I don't know. Something to be able to look at it right then. It, like say like on my LA trip, this June 18th, if, 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 there's going to be humpbacks around and it'd be cool to be like, yo, that's Theodore. Yeah. He was last seen in Monterey two years ago, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, on the East Coast, that's essentially what a lot of boats do now is they have their own in-house paper catalog on the boat right and it has yeah. first seen you know if they know if it's male or female um some companies have like a calving history log and and then the naturalist delivers that information right there on the microphone yeah um yeah. so to be able to do that anywhere in the world would be really cool it'd be a great asset for naturalists i think um we don't have cell service on the bank a lot and so oh. the paper probably would still exist for a long time off the coast of massachusetts but in California, I mean, you have cell service pretty much the whole trip. So yeah. um, you definitely could use that as a tool. And those whales are not, I don't know, the site fidelity thing and like the big wind events that like it gets pretty messy to try and remember all these whales in your head as a naturalist in Monterey. That's been my experience. Yeah. They also all have like all black tails, which is so difficult. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Totally true. And like, and then in Hawaii, I mean, I, I, oh, yeah. you know, it's like a joke, I think, among naturalists is like, oh, yeah, that's well, such and such. Oh, I just made that up. Yeah, we never yeah. see the same whales. You're like, well, actually, you know, I mean, and, and at this point, there's like a 70% chance that any whale you photograph in Hawaii is going to be in our database. And that's yeah, the, we have that's some that. really good regular customers at Pacific Whale Foundation. Um, one guy, Paul, he happy whales all the time and then he yeah. comes on the next trip and tells me you know these are the matches i got and like this is where the whale came from and it. this whale's actually been awesome. here for 25 days which is like way longer than we originally thought and i was like wow that's actually really cool he's way into it i love so, that yeah 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 no and that's it's how it is for me is it's like we're not going to reach everybody but you get that like the the few people that super engage in it and it just to me it's just like if we can add value to you know one or five percent of the people that are that are that are out there whale watching, that's this huge success, I think. Yeah, yeah for sure. So I have a question about like research features because I know you talk to some um, like organizations like Pacific Whale Foundation or mm -hmm. um, Allied Whale or you know any other big catalog storing um, places. So do they have some features that they can use for their own like collaboration with happy whale that are like research tools through happy whale that like maybe the general public doesn't use yeah, totally. or yeah okay yeah and that's that's one front of development i mean essentially like initially this was just a service right you send us your photos and we'll identify them and you know send them back and then and then more and more um we're getting research collaborators where they have a data manager login and they're able to use the matching directly and set up data imports and do searching with more, basically a broader range of tools. If you go to the browse page, you got all these tools to search by various parameters, but they, there's a whole another set of tools, for example. Um, and then there's also like across the North Pacific, um, we put together this collaboration and most of the data, thankfully, like Cascadia was really the, the, the forefront of this saying, yes, show the public this data. But some research collaborators, whether it's, you know, by whatever circumstance, they're just not, they're not comfortable or not able to have the data publicly available. So then we'll have this kind of this fenced group where if you're part of this collaboration, you can see the citing history and mm -hmm. everyone has agreed, okay, well, if we see something in here, public or not, as if it comes from a collaborator, we won't use it. We won't post about it. We won't whatever. We won't write a paper about it until we talk to everyone. So I think it's more collaboration is a, a concept and then supported by tools. And there's, there's so much to continue developing on that, on that end. 
but uh, but yeah, definitely. I mean, PWF has been they've been they've they've kind of jumped on it from the front because I mean they're now our largest single contributor by like. well I think it's like taken so much burden off the research team because I volunteer and they're doing um dorsal fin id matching and like that is so tedious because you just like you have two screens and you're just like click 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 oh that might be one click click click. it's like to do that with humpback whale flukes when you have this incredible tool is like I think it'd be torture for someone to yeah. a computer yeah. and well, manually do it. <laughs> and it's funny too, because like the flip side of that is, you know, in New England, you have such a long history of photo ID yeah, and, you know, Canada as well. And there's folks that like, they just don't want anything to do with automated matching because the manual matching is fun. And that's like, cool. Great. Awesome. Go for it. Yeah. yeah Their yeah, wheels totally. are a lot easier to manual match. I will are say. They? <laughs> yeah they have a lot more like t1s and t2s sure yeah it's more and, kind of a spread of yeah, yeah yeah and they really have like these little pockets of incredibly high site fidelity like uh-huh. there's whales in the gulf of maine that are like only found on jeffrey's ledge and only uh-huh. found on stell wagon bank and like it's like they're like oh nile's old faithful on stell wagon if there's no awesome. other whales around nile's gonna be there and you're like all right <laughs> i didn't know it was that fine of a site fidelity but that totally yeah makes sense the flip side have you ever really looked at like australian or south pacific flukes no well all <laughs> they're the same. really hard too Ooh, they're all white and white. they're all yeah, they, white they, exactly. with like just this like and they'll have this little rim of black along the trailing edge and you're like trying to tell by basically yeah. how much wider is it and obviously some of them are super distinct but it's just And, you know, so our, you know, like there's that middle set of whales that scar white on black and black on white, but then some of our all black tails, they don't scar white on black. And those, you'll see that there's barnacles on them and then there's, there's no scar Mm -hmm. or very fine scales. And if you have a really good photo, but that was a big deal. Like, you know, we had, we learning that this algorithm works very well on those flukes was just this huge triumph because yeah yeah, so now pacific whale foundation is just piling 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 like 30 years of data in. i mean this they had already manually matched like ten thousand photos Mm -hmm. Um, yeah and of course they have a library of binders of each year from each (laughs) field season it's crazy to look at you just yeah. look up there and you're like, oh my God, those are all fluke yeah. photos. And it's like a whole wall of binders. Yeah, the human hours involved. And that's what's cool about it is we could never have done this if not for having all that to build on. It's not like we just kind of stepped in like, oh, move aside humans, we have a machine. It's not <laughs> yeah. like that at all. Um, uh-huh. So yeah, so I'm like, yeah, I have a lot of, lot of appreciation for all that. I have a question. Do you have a favorite whale? I have a, fa- I have a few. I have a few favorite whales. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say Fran is one, totally. Yeah, I knew, I knew he's going to, gonna, just because you're from here, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, cause, 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 because of Ferd, I don't know if any of you know Ferd, but it's, it's like he, uh, you know, he adopted Fran and his, his, his late wife. And it's just like, mm-hmm. he is just such a, you know, wonderful person. And then you have this whale that like, we see Fran all the time. I, yeah. And, and, and so it is this, this, you know, anthropomorphized human persona, but she's also showing up when we know who her mom is and we know, you know, all this. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's, um, there's a couple, there's Frosty, which was the first whale that I ever matched. Like oh, I nice. got all these images from Cascadia and we kind of like trying to make the first image recognition work. And I, you know, it's like, here's all these photos. I, I can't remember if it was my photo or maybe it was Kate Spencer's. Kate was one of the first to give me this big trove of images and then a bunch from Monterey Bay Whale Watch and such. But um, um, then there's this whale in Antarctica that seriously, we should give it the whale a name or I should, but, um, but it was this whale that um, I photographed Um, along the Antarctic Peninsula. And then a few days later, I went into the US base, uh, Palmer Station, and I walk into the men's bathroom and there's a picture of the whale, 
like diving in the Gerlach Strait, which is like this just insanely beautiful part of the Antarctic Peninsula. It's like glaciers and you know, icebergs and all this. And there's my whale diving. And I'm like, I know that whale. You know, and this was in the awesome. bathroom. Like, yeah, I, totally. remember, I and, think I remember you talking about that whale before. Right. So I go and I get my camera and I bring it into the men's bathroom and I like, take a picture <laughs> of this whale on the wall. But we have since seen that whale twice after I'm, I, I need to give the whale a name. But you uh, should name it. Yeah, totally. What's um, the name of the, was, the place where you were in the bathroom? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's Palmer. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, but then there's this whale that, um, that uh, she, um, I uh, saw her twice on the silver bank and she full on, this was like in water experience that that's her, right? There. I was going to say, is she behind <laughs> you? Yeah, that's her. <laughs> full on would just like swim right up to you. And it's just like, Whoa, whale in my face. And yeah. uh, saw her in 2006 and then in 2011. And it was just uh, like the second time this whale just comes out of the blue and just swims right up to us. And I'm like, Whoa, what's, what's up with this whale? And, we actually, you know, the one of them, I never really got a fluke shot because in 2006 and 2011, I didn't, I hadn't even started this, but uh, we, after the fact, managed to figure out, um, you know, you can't see the fluke shot in there, but I managed to like rotate it and extract it and match her. Um, and, uh, and, and then there's one sighting of her up in, uh, in, in Newfoundland. Um, oh, cool. Yeah. I I so. Yeah, so every whale that I'm like, that was whale was like mm, really special to me. I have since managed to see afterwards um, and find via happy whale. But yeah, there's 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 a bunch too. I'm also yeah. really fond of, fond of prime suspect, which is the whale that we're pretty sure was the one that breached yeah, on, on yeah. Tom Mustill. Yeah. yeah, I was going to actually ask you a follow-up question about where are you at with whale detective and do you still talk to Tom? And uh, I have, yeah. He was writing a book on artificial intelligence and, uh, wow. so, and then he had a kid and he kind of dropped off. Well, I, we, you know, it was it's allowed. A, <laughs> such an exciting, excitable and, you know, and, and infectiously interested guy. Um, but uh, yeah, where is, uh, let's see. I, I wonder know. if I've seen that whale. Prime suspect and prime I suspect. Not a, I am not a contributor on it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, me neither. Yeah. Oh, you haven't seen it either? No, no. But um, but we've worked so hard to figure this out. I mean, Tom, first off, he's like, he shows me this video. And I'm like, you find this well? I'm like, dude, just get lost. <laughs> like, yeah. no, no, <laughs> we can't. This is ridiculous. It was such quality. Yeah. I mean, it's like iphone video from shore and then he shows me a couple more i'm like uh maybe and we i think we at first we had like 64 potential you know whales id'd in the immediate area because it was just this like this time of total feeding frenzy right close to they yeah. were like doing whale watching from horseback in in uh, moss landing you know i remember what year was it uh, uh, 2016 16 or i think it was like september i don't you know i for a while i had the date burned that was when there was crazy whales around right yeah well yeah i mean both those seasons were incredible i was out that day that was what inspired me to move here like september 12 2015 was the day that she was he she actually i don't think we know um yeah the day of the breach yeah, I remember seeing it in the distance. I saw the whales breach because we were on our way up there. Uh -huh. And then all of a sudden on the radio, it was like, there's kayakers in the water. Like the whale jumped on them. We were like, what? Because we were still over a mile away when it happened. So uh -huh. we couldn't see it all go down. We just saw the whale breach and then heard the chaos on the radio. Yeah, and we ended up, it was actually like from a pectoral fin mm -hmm. that was associated with a series of photos and this and that, that we, that we made it like, yeah, it's like, could you? I mean, I couldn't, yeah. Would <laughs> you acquit or would you whale. <laughs> convict the whale? It's yeah, pretty close, but I think it was, a, it was a good case that that was the whale. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. I wonder, so, oh, sorry. Oh, good. You go, Slater. It might probably really quick. What, how many, I was curious, how many individual contributors do you think you have right now on Happy Whale? Do you, if you know? It's like over 8,000. Um, oh, cool. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I saw your over 360,000 images. 
Oh my gosh. It's no, it's like, it's like a half million images now. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> I can, I can give you an exact number of the very last image submitted. It would be well, 588 of those are me. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> 495,744. Wow. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. So my other question is, um, do you accept submissions of photos of other species of whales other than humpback whales? Totally. And that's been, you know, so like 98% of the data in here is humpbacks and flukes, especially. But um, we, thanks to, um, you know, ask requests from some other projects, we basically started I mean, early on. Kellen Bukidis was said, "Hey, you know, if we're going to if we're going to point people to this one place, you know, we don't want to say like, oh, you know, send your blue whales over here, but then your humpback whales over there." So we're like, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, well, we can take multiple species, even if we're only going to focus on ID of humpbacks. But um, um, but so in the Antarctic, in particular, um, British Antarctic Survey and the Southern Ocean. Um, SORP, Southern Ocean Research Partnership um, kind of asked like, hey, can you get photos of right whales for this one project British Antarctic Survey was doing and, and so on is doing. Um, and we kind of, because of my work on Antarctic expedition vessels, there were all these different citizen science projects that were saying, hey, we want pictures of leopard seals. We want pictures of Waddell seals. And as Happy Well started to actually work, it was like, well, hey, you guys can all just put those here and we'll pass them on to there. So like killer whales in the Antarctic go to Bob Pittman and Holly Fernbach and, um, um, and team. And it's made it that we get a lot more data with a lot less work for them. Mm -hmm. Super psyched on the right whales because we got um, a photo from tour vessel out around South Georgia, another photo from a uh, tour vessel along the peninsula. And a woman named Amy, Amy Kennedy manually matched them and found it was the only known connection between cool. the peninsula and South Georgia. Um, so that was, that was kind of, yeah, that was pretty. And then like randomly um, a guy I knew from Antarctic work sends me some photos from, uh, from way out in the Gulf of Alaska. He's like, hey, are you interested in these photos? it's a northern north pacific right whale and we're like uh yeah. north pacific right whale <laughs> yeah we'll, yeah, we'll take those yeah. We'll yeah, take exactly those. Yeah. and we'll all take one <laughs> <laughs> exactly like it was um craig uh is it Mac? craig um craig Matkin, i think um in the gulf of alaska i think it was he said oh yeah i don't think there's been a, a right whale seen in that area for 50 years <laughs> or something. I don't doubt like, it. You know, that's about that. right. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, so that's, it's like this, this, there's this kind of like long thin tail of other species, but mm -hmm. it's starting to grow. So there's a right, a, a leopard seal project that's using happy whale. And, you know, will this lead to automation? I hope so. Totally. You know, the ability to basically get images in of species X and, and match them um, and plug in a different algorithm. That's not, um, yeah, technically it ends up being a, a bumpy road, but super yeah. psyched for it. And it, it's really great to, you know, we built the information architecture, absolutely should use it for, for other, uh, you know, other purposes and such. So, so yeah. right now it's more like a, a database or like a hub to put stuff, but it's not, the algorithm's only working on humpback whales. It's not working on anything else. Correct, correct. Okay. So we're currently building in uh, another another algorithm from a, a project in the in the Atlantic, and then we're so the algorithm that we're using was built in with support from Google on this algorithm development platform that they have called Kaggle, um, and super successful we had like 2100 teams that contributed solutions oh, wow. cool. that we got to pick from right so and yeah extremely successful and i mean that sort of simplifies you know it's, it was it was quite a process but um but they're supporting us doing another version a dorsal id effort so we shall see how successful that is hopefully it'll be able to we've gotten i think our training set is like 80,000 images oh wow different species so yeah see what comes of it um so yeah and then and then so also like we're getting killer whales from 
the North Pacific and um, a woman named Emma Luck, who's Emma Luck, yeah, right, yeah. 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 So she's just been, we basically assign submissions to her when mm -hmm. we get, okay, so we'll set up the voyage and we'll set up the encounters. And then she goes in and she IDs the individuals and then adds the ID on there. So, you know, you've got the image recognition, but the, the actual storage of the ID is something you can do manually. Right. Oh, and then cool. a lot of times people say, Oh, well, you know, in the comments, this is such and such whale. And we look at the dorsal and then we'll look at the dorsal of, you know, another photo of the same whale and say, Oh yeah, you're right. Cool. Put the ID on there. So, yeah. Well, that's good to know. Cause mm -hmm. I have like 50 different blue whales from last year that I've, I've sent to John. Yeah. Um, but I'll submit them there as well. I don't know, you know, how likely it is that they'll get matched, but I mean, it's, it's so cool, you know, for an endangered species like the blue whale off of California, you know, yeah. th that, that would be great information, I'm sure. Yeah, totally. I mean, in blue whales, they're so matchable, but tough. By they the are, eye, right? They, they are. are. Yeah. Yeah. So modeling is tough. Yeah. Well, awesome. I'm so glad we got a chance to talk to you, Ted. Thank you for taking some time with us. We love Happy Whale and we talked about it a lot. Um, but we just wanted to share it with our listener base. And if anybody that's listening wants to submit images, it's happywhale.com. And it gives you all the instructions. It's really user-friendly. And I'm sure Ted would love to see all of your photos if you have them. So, Thank yeah. you. Um, where's some other ways that people can kind of follow along with Happy Whale? You guys have social media, right? Facebook, too. Yeah, Facebook, uh, Instagram. It's kind of like we go in, in waves. It's personally to me, like social media, like, yeah, it's awesome. It's a good way to communicate, but um, I don't spend a lot of time on it. We're maybe trying to pick it up a little bit. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Facebook, Instagram. Um, and then you can follow individual whales and you can, you know, yeah. that. that straight into happy well i mean i wouldn't pretend that it's really whale social media but yeah, it's kind of a little it kind of is. <laughs> it's close it's yeah. close yeah you can comment on the encounter so it's close yeah. Yeah. and you can follow your favorite whales or whales that you've seen or however you want to do it yeah slater likes to look at the map i love it i'm looking at it right now i, I guess inverse <laughs> was just seen here again yeah. and i saw him first time in 2017 <laughs> yeah, my favorite yeah. thing there that I think some 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 folks miss is that little button, the show individual connections, you know, where it's like if you do a search for you like, you know, search for Monterey Bay in the last week, right? And then show individual connections and it shows you where all those whales, mm. you know, like all the migratory connections we know from those individuals, right? So I love that. And I'll, you know, it's just like there are it's fun because there are complex patterns but definite patterns in there and you know just just understanding i mean to me especially like back you know a few years ago when there was all the to do about building a wall for mexico it's like there's no walls in the ocean thank goodness yeah no <laughs> the whales yeah. don't care <laughs> yeah 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 good stuff well, ah, super yeah fun to chat with you guys appreciate you coming on and taking the time to talk with us right on yeah thank you Alrighty. and thanks everyone for listening um, you can follow Happy Whale on social media. You can also follow Whale Nerds on social media. Um, all of our handles are at Whale Nerds, so we're pretty easy to find. And um, thank you to our Patreon subscribers for supporting us. You'll get to see um, the video version of this episode, and you'll get to see the whale that Ted was talking about is on the wall behind him in the uh, <laughs> video screen. So, um, yeah, thanks so much, everyone, and um, thanks Wait. for listening. Adam, hit him with a secret whale. What is oh, it? Man. Ooh, I don't know. It has to be one of Ted's. Like, oh, I'm thinking like maybe a frosty. It could be frosty. What's, I don't know. What do you think? Ted, I think Ted should choose. Ted should choose frosty what the secret whale is. Whale. Frosty's a good whale. It's, there's a bunch of whales named Frosty, but it's Frosty, California. California. There we go. Yeah. Frosty, All right. I looked that up. I was just like, say Frosty, California, frosty. and we'll know frosty what you California. mean. <laughs> known from Cabo, known from um from uh from Nayarit right like Banderas Bay yeah, Nayarit, down in Guerrero Nayarit. and then a whole lot in California Farallons um San Luis Obispo and then nice. yeah Monterey yeah good, good. Frosty California oh. Frost yeah. sorry my computer started ringing <laughs> <laughs> all right awesome. at the end if you made it to the end of the episode yeah bye awesome thank Alrighty. you yeah